So before I begin, what I am going to do, you know, tonight, just to get things rolling, as I mentioned to Brenda this morning, this afternoon, I know we talked several times today, is I, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to rehearse, I'd like to revisit, you know, some of the topics that we talked about earlier so that we can adjust our thinking. And so I can put my thinking cap on as well and, uh, and just, you know, get things, get things rolling. I need to tell you this before I begin, because this is interesting. At least I thought it was. When I was reading a little bit on the on Memorial Day, and you know, I didn't I did not realize, or I had forgotten, that Memorial Day was begun in the Confederate South, you know, to uh, to to remember the Confederate soldiers who had fallen in the lost cause. We don't have to get into that. So I didn't realize that Memorial Day, you know, is a Southern tradition. And the other thing that I never realized is that in the Confederate South, for years, they never celebrated Thanksgiving. It was a Northern holiday proclaimed by Lincoln, and we want no part of a Northern holiday, you know, that was proclaimed by Lincoln. Makes sense, doesn't it? I never knew that. Well, there's a lot of things I don't know, you know. But I thought that was quite interesting. What I do not know is when the celebration of, you know, of Thanksgiving, you know, reappeared in the, uh, in the, in the Confederacy. But this I do know. And, and let's begin here. A little bit of an overview for all of us and for me, and particularly for those who missed the first couple of sessions, just to get your, you know, get your head moving again. The, the war was called, you know, below the Mason-Dixon line, the War of Northern Aggression. And I want to deal with this a little bit. And, you know, if you have a, a question, jot it down, because if you don't, you'll forget. And I'll forget to ask you, what was the question you jot it down? You know, and that happens, you know, all the time, doesn't it? So the war of northern aggression, uh, that we, you know, we left the Union peaceably, and there was nothing in the Constitution, and you know I always carry a copy with me. You know, I have one in every coat pocket. It helps when you get pulled over, particular if an escapee from Tennessee, you know. The privileges and immunities of citizenship the 14th Amendment, and I'll get back to that later on um, before we close, that the, you know, the war of northern aggression that we left, come on in, did you pay your rent? <laughs> we haven't passed the, we haven't passed the hat yet, but we will. <laughs> Dig deep. So for, for the Confederacy, or, or in, in the aftermath of the war, you know, it was referred to as the War of Northern Aggression. We left the Union peaceably. And, there was not, and they were right on this. There was nothing in the Constitution which prohibited secession. There was no language that prohibited. Now, Lincoln said, of course not. See, Lincoln was clever in using words against people. Lincoln said, of course. Of course you're right. There was no language prohibiting secession because who would want to leave? Yeah. You know, this is the best deal you've ever received. And that's why there's language here for entering the Union, but there's no language for leaving the Union. You know, it's like you know, when you're in divorce court. Who would want to leave me? I'm the best deal in town. And you know it. I'm just talking metaphorically here. All right? You know I'm the best deal. Why would you ever want to leave me? And this is Lincoln. The, the framers of the Constitution were inviting states to join, to expand the Union. There's language here to expand the Union over time and not to see it contract. No, you cannot leave. And they said, well, we can because our grandfathers joined the Union. That no longer serves our purpose. You are threatening our way of life. Most importantly, you are threatening slavery. And, and you cannot do that. 
Now, most white Southerners did not own slaves, but they took up arms to defend what they called states' rights. Now, it was not about states' rights at all. Um, that was a, a red herring. You know, it was about defending our way of life and, and, as a sidebar, defending slavery. But defending our way of life from you Northerners that are all about making money, having people crushed in the cities, and, 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 and it's not the way we want to be. And we are leaving. Thank you very much. And you can't prohibit it. We are leaving. I'm leaving you. You. Well, I'm leaving you. You no longer suit my purposes. <laughs> Not you. We are no longer safe in the union our grandfathers created. And Lincoln said, you cannot leave. Well, we're leaving, aren't we? And it all came to a head with the, or an, another head, you know, with the attack on Fort Sumter in April. Is that right? And I'm checking myself, in April of 1860, 1861. And, you know, what was to be simply a short war, maybe ending by July of 1861, turned into a horrendous battle, didn't it? You know, with the, the largest war in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Lincoln didn't expect that. You know, Jefferson Davis, you know, who was president of the Confederacy, did not expect it either. In fact, if you recall, if you were here, one of the times we met, that Jefferson Davis, you know, wanted no part of being president of the Confederacy. He wanted a field command. I'm a West Point graduate. You know, I want to command an army. And it came to him. And he did not want it. And sometimes things come to you even when you don't want them. And you do this, you do this, you do this. No, no, you know, it's like saying, will you marry me? No, no, but you wind up saying, yes, yes, and yes again. So the war was on in April of 1861, a war that lasted until April of 1865. And now stop me if we need to fill in here and there, because I will, you know, in in 1863, because we're going to get to the 13th Amendment shortly, in 1863, Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And he issued it by an executive order. Now, executive orders are signed by presidents repeatedly, aren't they? In fact, it was George Washington who signed the first executive order in, in his presidency. Now, there's nothing in the Constitution there it is. There's nothing in the Constitution that specifically allows for an executive order. But there's language there that if you hem and haw a little bit and dress up the words, it provides for an executive order. And simply an executive order is from the president's desk, you know, with his signature. The Emancipation Proclamation in January, anybody remember we talked about that? All right, thank you. It's always good to get an affirmative nod. Thank you. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I won't go there. I'll get terribly distracted. Yeah. You know how easy I can get distracted. In January of 1863, Lincoln issued a, the Emancipation Proclamation by an executive order from the desk of Abraham Lincoln. And it just had the, the strength of his signature. And what he feared, and I'll get back to this in a little bit, what he feared is if he were not reelected in 1864, and he did not believe he would be, that the incoming president, a general, well, he had been General McClellan, would issue an executive order in denying the Emancipation Proclamation. So what Lincoln is looking to do, and I'll come back to this, you know, over the course of his presidency, is that Lincoln wants to place the, Eman the Emancipation Proclamation in an amendment, the 13th and Amendment, because the, an amendment cannot be denied by an executive order. Once it's in the Constitution, it's there. It's tough to get an amendment out of the Constitution. 
And the only time an amendment was taken out of the Constitution was with prohibition, wasn't it? And an amendment does not have to be signed by a president either. It just, if two-thirds of the Senate, I'll speak to the camera, hi out there, if, is this just going into Walpole? Okay. If, um, for you living in Walpole, that of two-thirds of the, of the Senate and two-thirds of the Congress, House of Representatives, approve an amendment, and then it goes on out to the states, and three-quarters of the states must approve an amendment, then it gets in the Constitution. If not, it does not. Thousands of amendments, I'm not exaggerating here to make a point, thousands of amendments have been proposed. Only a handful, 27, have been added to the Constitution. And, and that is the beginning, you know, with Benjamin Franklin and Sam Adams and John Adams and so forth. And the man who proposed, the delegate who proposed the amendment proposition was an old cad, and that is Benjamin Franklin. And Franklin simply made the point, we don't know if what we're doing here is going to stand the test of time. So what we need to do is we need to have language where we can grow the country, you know, as the nation grows and new problems arrive. Now that's wisdom. And of course they did, didn't they? And with that, the, the amendments, amendments have only been added 20, 27 times. The last time an amendment was added was in 1992 on the Bill Clinton watch. So there you go. Thousands have been recommended. Only a few have made the way into the Constitution. Lincoln knew that. And that's why he wanted to move the Emancipation Proclamation, a, an edict, if you will, from the president to move it into an amendment. We'll get to that in a little bit. Now stop me if you need it, if, if this is new material, because I'm just pulling this out of my head, you know, as I remembered it. What do you want? Stopping you. And, go ahead, I'm only teasing, you know that. I, I'm finding the last amendment is the 26th. 27th. Okay, That's dated. That's dated as I am. And I think that amendment, the 26, gave 18-year-olds the right to vote. Am I right? Yep. Oh, just did I hit a grand slam? Perfect. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What do you want now? The 27th amendment. The 27th amendment. You ready for this? Dig deep in your billfold or your pocketbook. It gives the right of Congress, the, the right or the ability to give themselves a pay raise. Not bad, huh? Wouldn't you like to give yourself a pay raise? Not bad. I would. All of you would. Lincoln feared that in the, he would be defeated in the 1864 election. And the man who would be defeated was General George McClellan, whom he had fired, you know, after the Battle of Antietam. And McClellan, a Democrat, back then it was really important, Republican versus Democrat. In 1864, McClellan, General McClellan, whom Lincoln had fired, gained the nomination of the Democratic Party. And all the polls, there were no polls. I made that up, you know. But all the newspapers and, and all the talk on the ground was that McClellan would be elected. And McClellan was the peace candidate. He said, if, no, not if, when I'm elected, I will do two things. I will end the war. He ran as a peace candidate, you know, like Hubert Humphrey in 1968. I will end the war and I will allow the seceded states, and there were 11 of them, seceded states back into the Union, and the war will be over, and the dying will be finished, and they will be allowed to come back into the Union. And no questions asked, no punishment, it's over. There's been too much bloodshed. And McClellan, I was part of that. And Lincoln had fired him, because he had not done, McClellan had not done well at the Battle of Antietam, 
1864. And Lincoln expected to be defeated. And what Lincoln did, I'm almost done rehearsing this with you, unless you want me to back up a little bit. What Lincoln did at one of his cabinet meetings is that he circulated around the table what, was, what today is referred to as the blind memorandum. And he asked all of his cabinet members, sign this, just sign it. Well, what is it? Just sign it. You have my word, you know, that it's not harmful. Just sign it. And I'll tell you what it said. Because I spy. He said, I expect to be defeated in November. And I'm asking all of you to sign this memorandum that you will help the incoming administration, McClellan, the incoming administration to bring about a peaceful transfer of power from one administration to another. I want your word that you won't be cranky losers. Just sign it. They had no idea what they were signing, but they trusted Lincoln. He said, just sign it. How about that? We have no idea what you're signing. Just sign it. Okay. Okay. Well, Lincoln won, and he won by a large margin. Uh, he carried Massachusetts, and, you know, the war continued. And Lincoln, in, in that second inaugural, in March of 1865, he'll be shot in April, assassinated in April of 1865. In that second inaugural, I urge all of you to read the second inaugural. It's a prayer. It's a homily. It's Father Abraham speaking to the country. And in that homily, it's about 800 words, in that homily that there will be, he, that there will be a, with malice toward none, malice toward none, this will be a peace treaty in which there will be no hangings, uh, there will be no punishments, uh, there will be no jail terms. And what he hoped privately is that when the war was over and it's winding down in 1865, Appomattox is right around the corner, it's winding down that I hope that the leaders of the Confederacy flee the country. I hope they go to Mexico. I hope they go to Europe. There will be no hangings. I, there's been enough blood for families north and south. Read the second, not the second, yeah, the second inaugural with, mal, with malice toward none, with charity for all, to bind up the nation's wounds. And the irony of all of this, the, of all of this, is that he is almost the last fatality of the Civil War, isn't he? In that crowd, you know, listening to Lincoln speaking from the balcony of the, of the White House, and the crowds that come right up on the lawn. I mean, that doesn't happen today. Right up on the lawn of the White House. And they stood under his bedroom window, chanting, Lincoln, Lincoln, Lincoln. They wanted him to come out and say something, and he did. And in that crowd was John Wilkes Booth. And in that crowd, he talked about the fact that the war is over. I'm going to pardon most people, and I am considering giving, and he didn't define this, I'm considering giving intelligent blacks, those are his words, not mine, the right to vote. And that tripped a wire in John Wilkes Booth's head. And he must die, Lincoln must die before this happens. And in the boarding house, which had been provided to him by Mary Surratt, the second woman, the first woman to be executed by the United States government, that Mary Surratt had provided Booth and his accomplishments with rooms and with a conference room in which they talked about how to do in Lincoln. You see, the first attempt to do in Lincoln, and it failed, is that they were going to kidnap him. Because Lincoln was oblivious to his safety. You cannot be president and worry about your safety. You cannot. You do your job. And if somebody wants to get you, they get you, you know, unlike students. You, know, you, you, cannot, be, you cannot be oblivious to your life, you need to do the job. 
And so what Lincoln would do, because he was casual about his life, is that he would, you know, that he would get in a carriage, you know, provided with two or three escorts, and, and go up Pennsylvania Avenue to the old soldier's home and get away for the weekend, get away from Mary. We're not going to talk about her. Uh, she has a, a whole lot going on between her ears, unless somebody brings it up. You know, to get away from the office, to get away from generals, to get away from demands on my time, and to take a few days alone at the old soldier's home, which has recently been restored and is open now on the, on the tour in Washington, D.C. So that's where he was headed. He did it every weekend or every other day, and it was in the newspapers that Lincoln is going to take the weekend or Wednesday and Thursday at the old soldier's home. And Booth said, we're going to grab him. He has two men as military or escorts. We're going to shoot these two soldiers out of the saddle. And then we'll grab Lincoln, and we're going to hold him for ransom. We're going to get him across the Potomac and hold him for ransom with two demands. One, we'll give you Lincoln back if we get two things. One, you return all of our, all of our captured soldiers. And secondly, let us go. Leave us alone. You started this. We left peaceably. You came after us. It's a tough argument to defeat, isn't it? But, and if you think about it, I mean, that's Lincoln. You're not going to break up the Union. Our grandfathers built it, and they want it to grow, not to contract. And you have contracted it by 11 states. And what Lincoln always knew if I lose, and these are slave states, if I lose Missouri, if I lose Kentucky, if I lose what became West Virginia, if I lose Maryland, we're done. If I lose Maryland, the capital is surrounded on three sides by Maryland. We're going to have to leave. We're going to have to vacate and go back to Pennsylvania or maybe back to New York. I can't have that. So I'm hoping that these four slaves, Delaware, these four slave states that remained in the Union remain. And they have. We've won, or we're about to win. And Booth, now he must die. And not only must he die, that we are going to decapitate the head of the government. Not only are we going to get Lincoln, we're going to get Vice President Andrew Johnson. I'll come back to him momentarily. We're going to get the Secretary of State the Secretary of War, and we are going to decapitate the head of the federal government. And with that, there'll be such confusion that we'll be able to slip away. Gentlemen, are you with me? And Seven said, I'm with you. See, Booth was an actor, and he was an excellent Shakespearean actor. He could move a crowd. He brought the crowd to a standing ovation. And now he's got six or seven men with him. And he was a, an actor. And walking around with his, with his stick, with the gold top, tapping it on the floor. Are you with me, gentlemen? Are you with me? Are you bold? Do you want to? We'll have songs uh, to honor us. We'll have statues, poems. Are you with me? Bang. Tap. That's heady stuff, isn't it? Are you with me? To make history. To turn history around. We're with you. Well, none of that happened, as you well know. Uh, Lincoln was assassinated, and you see what Booth did. He said, I want you two guys to get Secretary of War. I want you two guys to get the Vice President, but I got Lincoln. I want to get Lincoln. And he did, didn't he? And that's a long story that we can talk maybe at another time with the same outcome. I want to get Lincoln. And he did. And the man who succeeded Lincoln, and that's our story for tonight, most of our story for tonight, will be Andrew Johnson. Now let me start for a minute. I'll start for five minutes, if need be. Is there anything in here that I need to go back and, and redefine for you? A piece here or a piece there? Oh, what now what? Am I supposed to translate that? What does it mean? It doesn't matter. You got to you got to share it. But um, when McClellan said he would let the eleven states back in, I take it. Not he'd let all the slave states back in. Let them all in as slave states. 
Pardon me? He, they keep all their slaves. I, I didn't hear it. So he was going to let them back in. Oh, yeah, the let, let them back in. As slave slaves. And slavery. No, there would not be any slavery. But I'm going to let you back in without any punishment. And not bad. For all the deaths, for the thousands and thousands of grieving families, I'll stop this war. You know, it's like 1968 in Vietnam. I always go back to this. Hubert Humphrey, if elected, I will stop this war. Nixon, if elected, I will stop this war. Went on for five more years, didn't it? I'll be doing a course somewhere. I'm not sure where. The Nixon presidency. And it's going to go from the Cold War to his, to his resignation. Andrew Johnson is selected by Lincoln as vice president. Why? Why? Andrew Johnson is from Tennessee, a slave state, a state that left the Union. Why would he take Andrew Johnson or select, or not appoint, select Andrew Johnson? It's a puzzle, isn't it? And I'm going to solve the puzzle with you right now. One, that Andrew Johnson had the good sense to remain in his Senate seat, even though Tennessee left the Union. Uh, there were 22 senators from the seceded states. 21 left the Union. Andrew Johnson, I am staying. Secession is wrong. I am staying to represent the interests of Tennessee. I don't know whether or not he got paid. Do you, I don't know. Probably not, but I am staying in my seat. And for Lincoln, there's a man of good sense. There's a man who's responsible. And for Lincoln, Andrew Johnson was a self-made man. His wife taught him how to read and write. How about that? This is your wedding gift. I'll teach you how to read and write. Lincoln had to learn with tutors and his stepmother about reading and writing. Andrew Johnson's my guy. Andrew Johnson was a self-made man. He had worked his way up from being a, a tailor, a self-made man. Lincoln, um, Andrew Johnson had the good sense to stay in the Union. I like his style. I like the way he operates. What Lincoln did not know is that Johnson had a violent temper that he kept hidden, like Dwight Eisenhower did, had a violent temper, and had a drinking problem. And I mean a major problem, which is going to surface at the inaugural in ways that confounded Lincoln. So Andrew Johnson is on the ticket. They're elected, much to Lincoln's surprise. And then a few weeks later, maybe a month later, Lincoln is shot down by John Wilkes Booth. And now Andrew Johnson, whom he didn't know at all, except he had certain credentials. I don't know this guy. I don't know him. And Andrew Johnson shows up at the inaugural, stinking drunk. <laughs> hey, wouldn't that be something today? Absolutely stinking drunk. He had Rudy. Pardon me? I'll leave that go there. He, he, he arrived stinking drunk. Now, his supporters said the reason he's been drinking so much from Tennessee to Washington is that he has a severe head cold. And he hopes if he drinks enough whiskey, that'll clear his head. Well, it'll also put you on the floor. So when, Andrew, when it became Andrew Johnson's turn to speak and to accept the nomination. You know, he turned it into a diatribe, you know, against members of the Senate, against members of the cabinet. See, Johnson had a problem. Nobody, res well, in his view, that no one had respected him. You know, that the elite of Tennessee, the elite of the Confederacy had dismissed him. You know, you're not a slaveholder. You've never had any money. You've never had a great plantation. And your wife, your wife had to teach you how to read and write, write, police, police. And Lincoln shows you, 
It shows you what bad judgment he has. So here is Andrew Johnson speaking and Lincoln turning to his personal bodyguard, Ward Hill Lehman, his personal bodyguard. There was no secret service back then at all. That's why Lincoln was careless about his safety. Uh, Ward Hill Lehman, his personal bodyguard. And Lehman, if you looked at a photograph of Lehman, him and he was as big as his room, and he, he carried an arsenal with him. He had guns and knives sticking out of his nose. He carried an arsenal with him. And Lincoln told Ward Hill Lehman, do not let that man speak again today. I never knew that he could drink this much. So they shut him down for the day, and the Lincoln was assassinated. And now comes our story, Amendments 13, 14, and 15. But be before we begin with the 13th Amendment, by the way, if you've been paying attention, the 13th Amendment has been in the news lately, hasn't it? And I'll show you where. Keep an eye on this stuff. It's still out there, you know, it still floats on the surface. I'll come right back to the 13th Amendment, but I want to pause for a moment. Question? Observation? Memory? No? I'll tell you the story. I told you, for those who were here, I told you the story. I'm going to tell it again. My first wife, and there'll be no other, because I choose not to do this again. Once is enough. Unless, you're really, unless you show me your 1040, you know. <laughs> and you've got really something here that I can take a look at and buy into. Her name, her maiden name was Davis. The family was from Kentucky. Jefferson Davis is from Kentucky. Lincoln is from Kentucky. Lincoln winds up as president of the Union. Davis winds up as president of the Confederacy. So I'm brought down, and I'm from Illinois, the land of Lincoln. My credentials are bad. I'm from Illinois. But they want to interview Highlander, the man from Illinois, the land of Lincoln. So I go down to Kentucky, and I have to pass two tests. One, how much can you drink your bourbon? Neat. Neat. No ice, no water, no sal salsa. Neat. Can you do the shots? I think I passed that. More importantly, did I ooh and ah over the gift that was given to me you know, as a wedding gift? And I knew there was going to be trouble here because it was wrapped in Confederate paper. You know? And out it came, a folded flag of the Confederacy. And I oohed and ah. <laughs> what a gift. How thoughtful. I shall treasure this forever. I have no idea where it is. Somewhere in my many moons, moves rather, it got lost or stolen. Destroyed, I'm not sure. But I don't have it today. He can hold his liquor. And he seemed to be awed by the flag of the Confederacy. Not only that, as I mentioned, it had 13 states in it. Not 11. It had 13 stars for Kentucky, where I was in, and Missouri. That this is the future. And I said, look at the future. I made that all up for them. So I passed. And the rest is in the history books. That said... Andrew Johnson thinks he is Lincoln, that he has all the cachet of Lincoln. See, Lincoln, when he laid out his plans for reunion, he was very gentle. Lincoln laid out his plans. It was called the 10% plan. He didn't know if it would work, but the 10% 10, the 10 plan was simply this. In January of 1863, when 10%, what a small 
threshold. Hear me well. You listening? Thank you. I know you are. When, <laughs> I can tell. Because if you were sleeping, I'd wrap your Nikes. If you, oh, you're doing this. Whenever I go to my physician, the first thing he does is hit my legs. He said, you can't sit like that. It's not good for your cardiovascular system. How do I know? I'm a doctor. I'm not a, a doctor of medicine. That said, in the 10% plan, Lincoln made a good. This is in January of 1863. When 10% of the voters of, let's say, Alabama, which had left the Union, Mississippi, it doesn't matter, when 10% of the voters of Alabama agree to the 10% plan and rewrite their constitution, in which they accept the end of slavery, apologize for the war, and I'll, I'll allow you back into the Union. You've made a mistake. Come in with me. The door is open. Very generous, very liberal. And he hoped that that plan would snowball you know, into Mississippi, into Arkansas, into North Carolina, and that others would pick up that plan and one by one by one, I can, re, I can reconstruct the union. Never happened. Didn't happen. Lincoln's dead. Andrew Johnson feels he has all the cachet, all the authority of Lincoln. And that the seceded states never left the union. They never left the union. They're still in the union. They just had a problem with language. They never left the Union. So I'm going to let you back into the Union on these conditions. I am the president. I have all the authority of Lincoln. I am the president. I will let you back into the Union. You have to accept the end of slavery. And you have to come for me, to me rather, and seek an apology. See, you guys you guys have defeated me. You guys have been unmerciful in your criticism of me. I never had all the slaves you had. I never had the money. I never had the, the plantation. You have to come to me, to me, and ask for a pardon. Now, he didn't say how generous he would be. Ask for a pardon. And boy, did they ever come. And can you hear it now? You know, these um, southern statesmen, officers, Lee, never, Lee got a pardon. He never asked for it. Um, walking into the Oval Office, uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, we humbly, it's taken off the hat, we humbly ask for your pardon, sir. Now, I'm not sure we made a mistake, but I'd like, to, I'd like from the state of Alabama to be able to run for office again and to represent the interests of the good people of Alabama. But I can't do that, sir, without your pardon, without your absolution. Andrew Johnson loved that. These men of wealth, these men of education, coming to me to ask me for a pardon, they loved it. He loved it. And he granted dozens and dozens and dozens of pardons, hundreds of pardons. And I can almost see it, can't you? In, in a movie, a, an Alabama Confederate general walking out and putting his hat back on, and others at a wedding said, how'd it go? Oh, it went well. It went very well. I've been pardoned. You have been? What did you say? Well, this is what I said, and I took my hat off, and I said, we made a terrible mistake, but I, I seek your pardon so I can represent the, where are you from, sir? Arkansas? That I can represent the good people of Arkansas one more time? Now, what'd you say again? Just what were the words you used, sir? Pardon after pardon after pardon after Congress. Pardon. Congress was upset by this. They wanted a piece of reconstruction. From the point of view of Congress, a Republican Congress, you seceded. You left the Union. You committed, at the time, what was called state suicide. That's not my word. 
That's the word that was used. You committed state suicide. You left the union. You are now conquered territory. And as conquered territory, as territory, only the Congress can admit states as territories, not you. Now, Lincoln never would have made that mistake. You have to come to us for a pardon. You have to come to us, two-thirds of you. Uh, two-thirds of us have to vote you, have to vote you a pardon. And you must accept the end of slavery. If not, if not, you will be, it will be the day after Appomattox. You'll be divided into five military zones with a union general in charge of each military zone to make sure, you know, that the law is, the law is followed and these recently freed freedmen are not being massacred, shot down, hanged. And then you have to come to us, and two-thirds of us must agree to a pardon for you, a senator or a general. So th this is the beginning of the turmoil. Johnson, these states never left the Union. I will pardon them. Congress, they committed state suicide. They left, and they reserted back to the status of territories. And only Congress, read your Constitution, only Congress has the right to admit territories. And that began, I don't get a chance to use this word too often, I can't spell it. Brouhaha. Great word, isn't it? Brouhaha. I cannot spell it, but I know how to pronounce it. Anybody use the word brouhaha from time to time? Oh, it's a great word. Great word. The moderates, the Republicans. Johnson's a Democrat. The moderates in Congress were willing to work with Johnson as long as he calmed down and did not think he was Lincoln and will work with us, you know, to put together a plan to reconstruct the Union. Johnson, this is not reconstruction. He called it restoration. But we're simply going to restore the old Union. So wait a minute. We have to do some reconstruction here. We can't have the planter class, you know, back in operation like nothing happened. This has to be a reconstruction of the economy, of who runs the, of who runs the South. Now, you can read all about that if you like, and I urge you to do so. No, I don't. If you feel like doing it, do it. I mean, it's, I mean the books are enormous on reconstruction or on restoration. Moderate Republicans were willing, I want to say this again, were willing to work with Johnson. I'm not working with them. I'm Lincoln. I'm not as big as he is. I have a size 14 shoe, a size 9, not a 14. But I am Lincoln in terms of my presidential powers. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? No. We are not, I'm not working with you. And then comes the trouble. Uh, uh, Senator Sumner of Massachusetts, Thaddeus Stevens of, Penis, of, Penicillin, of Pennsylvania, and others, they were called radical Republicans. Not because they're Marxist, but we want to completely reconstruct the South and punish those who tore this country apart and, and lured the good people of the South into rebellion, into rebellion. Sounds familiar, huh? January 6th, to storm the Capitol almost, into rebellion. And you will be punished. And those of you who wish your pardon have to come to us and ask, and we'll decide whether or not to pardon you and allow you to rejoin the political circuit. All of this comes to a head in the off-year elections of 1866. All right, we have an off-year election coming soon, don't we? All of this comes to a head in the off-year elections of 1866. Andrew Johnson 
takes to the field. And I want to, I want to support my candidates. And I want to be public about it, and I'm going to support my people to get them elected. My people. Not those people. My people. And he goes out on the hustings. This is the first time a presidential candidate had ever appeared on the hustings asking for a vote for that con it was all men, that congressman, that congressman, that congressman. And he would get riled up. He had a temper. He could flame out. And the crowd knew he had a temper, and they knew that he could be agitated. And the crowd would begin to chant at Andrew Johnson. Name names. Who are those people who, are, who you identify as radical Republicans? Who are those people who are working against you? Who are those people who are behind the assassination of Lincoln? And Johnson said, you want names? You want names? I'll give you names. I mean, he could get himself riled up. You know, you know some people who could get themselves riled up. They don't even need to be riled up. They can get themselves worked up. I know you know people like that. I'm not one of them get themselves riled up. I can pretend I'm riled up, especially when I'm disciplining my dog. I can pretend to get riled up. Name names, President Johnson. Name names. I'll give you names. And he began to name names. Charles Sumner, Sumner not Sumner Tunnel, but Charles Sumner, senior senator from Massachusetts. And then he went on and on and on and on. And they are involved in the conspiracy to kill Lincoln. They are? They were? Yes. Yes. And they should not be allowed to hold office again by the good people of the United States. You can imagine how that got people aggravated. I mean, this was, this was a long time ago. Name names, and he gave them names, and they were involved in the assassination of Lincoln? Yes. Yes. And it is regrettable and they should not be voted into office. 1866, an off-year election. So among the radical Republicans now and the more moderate Republicans, do we want this guy to be around for another four years? Or do we want to remove him now and take the chances? Do we, we want to remove him now and use the powers of impeachment that are in here or do we want to wait four years, two more years? And they talked about this, and the answer was no, no, no. We cannot allow this poison in the White House for another two years. We have to get rid of him now and not wait for an election to clean house. What side would you be on? We can't wait for allow this poison to get into the rest of the, you know, the, rest, of the, the rest of the country. And to begin the process of trying to find out what's on Johnson's mind, he held cabinet meetings, and he would speak his truth to his cabinet. And Johnson was puzzled that when I lay out to my cabinet what I plan to do and how I plan to fend off these attacks, my plans are known by the Republicans within hours after we talk about it around the Capitol, around the, uh, you know, around the conference table. How can this be? How do they know this? There's a spy. There's a spy in my cabinet. Who is it? Who is spying? Who is passing information on to the radical Republicans and the other Republicans. Who is the man who's leaking all this information? And Johnson, can you imagine him looking around? Who do I not trust here? You? You? Whom do I not trust here? And he focused on, on see, he kept all of Lincoln's cabinet, which was a mistake. You get your own people in. And he focused on, on Secretary of War Stanton. He's the leak. Secretary of War Edward, sometimes it's Edward, Stanton. He's the leaker. 
Now, Congress knew that Johnson would find out at some, at some point. So they had passed, and I'll say this two times so you've got it, three times maybe, the tenure, this is so clumsy, it was called the Tenure, T-E-N-U-R-E, Tenure. The Tenure of Office Act, that no president can dismiss a cabinet member without the approval of Congress. Tenure, the Tenure of Office Act, that no president can fire a member of his cabinet without the approval of Congress. Now, we all know that a cabinet serves at the pleasure of the president, don't they? He picks that person. All he needs to do is get it by the Senate. And nine out of 10 times, nine and a half out of 10 times, he gets or she gets approved. This is my team. I want to work with my team. And now Congress is saying, you cannot remove anybody without our approval. Can you imagine Johnson looking around the table? Who's the son of a bitch? Who's the Judas that's betraying me and betraying my plans? It's Stanton. I know it's Stanton. He fires Stanton. He's not supposed to do it, but he fires Stanton. You are dismissed. And Stanton gets up, collects his paper, papers, and goes to his office and locks himself in. I am not coming out. I'm not accepted. I'm not accepting being fired. I'm not coming out. Now, this is, this is news all over the country. Certainly in, in the northern press, in the New York press, Stanton locked himself in the office and I'm not coming out. I'm not accepting being fired by the President of the United States. This is big news. It'd be on CNN, wouldn't it? It'd be all over the place. So what he does is he locks himself in and he gets hungry. So he has a basket on a long rope. <laughs> he lowers it down to his supporters and they put food in it. I don't like Cheerios. Frosted flakes. He, and he gets his food from the crowds down at the foot of his window who are supplying him with, with food. Great television, don't you think? Thank you, fellas. Thank you all. He refuses to get out for a while. And it becomes a horrible story, and th um, an embarrassing story. And that's when Congress says, we're going to impeach this guy. We can't wait for two more years. He's an embarrassment to the country. We're going to impeach him. So they draft up articles of impeachment. There are 14 articles, maybe 12. We'll say 14. I like round numbers. Or on, on, not, I, I like even numbers. There are articles of impeachment. You can read them when you get home tonight. And they all say the same thing, except the last one. The last one is a little break in the dialogue. He is an embarrassment as president. He is not fit to be president. He does not have the temperament to be president. Impeach him. Get him out now. We can't afford to wait for an election. So they draw up these articles of impeachment. And there is a trial in the Senate. Chief Justice Samuel Chase is the Chief Justice. And all the rules of evidence apply. Now, Johnson doesn't show up. He doesn't have to. The president does not have to sign off on it. He does not have, well, he is the president. But the, you know, he doesn't have to sign off on anything. He hires two or three prestigious lawyers to represent him that the Tenure of Office Act is unconstitutional. I choose my cabinet, and they serve at my pleasure, not the pleasure of the Congress. So the vote is taken. The country is tense. I wish I could tell you it was be televised. The vote is taken. You know, I, 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 nay, 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 I, nay, I, nay. And it comes down to a junior senator from <clears throat> Kansas, Ross, Senator Ross. Can you imagine? And he's counting, I mean, the leaderboard is there. 
I was watching some golf. The leaderboard is there. And it's going to come down to me. Holy. You fill in the blank, okay? <laughs> it's going to come down to me. Me. Ross is getting all kinds of pressure from the Republicans. He's a Republican. And they know that he's been on the fence about whether or not we ought to impeach Johnson for political purposes. And he's followed. He's followed. Uh, he has people, when he has dinner, sitting as close to his table as they can to overhear conversations. He is followed. He's harassed. He knows it. It's coming down to me. And when the vote comes, nay, nay, Johnson survives by one, Johnson survives by one vote. Nay, nay. Now, Ross is not reelected as senator, as you can imagine, and he finds himself as a territorial governor later on in the Grant administration of Oklahoma, I don't know. But the Republicans want Grant in 1868. They want Grant now, the hero of Appomattox. And Grant wins. He wins big. His presidency is not too successful. Pardon me, his wife. In fact, his wife wants to run for a third term. Ulysses, she called him Yuli. Yuli, we're out of money. We don't make enough money. You need to run for a third term. Well, that's not going to happen. So whatever money they have left, they, uh, you know, they go off and travel in Europe. So Johnson, well, eventually, you know, Johnson retires to Tennessee. He's elected a senator again to represent Tennessee. And at the end of that term, he goes home and he dies of a heart attack. But, but at least he knows I got elected again to represent Tennessee. And the hero of Appomattox, you know, General Grant, is the next president of the United States. And he has his issues. He is squeaky clean. The men he appoints are not. They are all thieves. And they're, they're, they're lifting money from the public till. And, and Mrs. Grant wants to run for a third term. Yuli, we have no money. Yeah, but the tradition is two terms and you're out. Well, I know. We'll make it three and you're out. We need money. So that doesn't happen. So Grant is done. Andrew Johnson is done. And the 13th Amendment, let's not forget these. The 13th Amendment. How does licorice get in my pocket? Where did I put the glasses? Can anybody help me out? Which pocket? You can work for me any day. You can find a pot of gold. So that 13th Amendment, and by the way, the Spielberg film, basically is about the passage of the 13th Amendment, which, by the way, is a good film. He's got Lincoln right. Now, the 13th Amendment has come up again recently to have one line from the 13th Amendment expunged, removed from it. I'll read the whole amendment to you. Now, the slavery, and here's the part they want people to, to have it expunged, nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereas the party shall have been convicted. Read the amendment. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime. Involuntary servitude. After the Civil War, after the, when the, when the federal troops pull out, and don't let me forget that election of 1876, when the federal troops pull out, and black Americans have no protection when those federal troops pull out, that judges and will sentence men or women, basically men, to... I want you to work on that plantation until the crop is in, until the crop gets planted. I want you to work in, the, in that coal mine 
I want you to work in the fishing boats. I want you to work in the lumber industry. These men here, and these are justices, they're all members of the clan or whatever. They need help. And they need you to help get the crop in, to work to fell the trees. So there we have it. It's still in there. Let me get, run, run it by you again and not poke my eye out. Nor involuntary servitude. Involuntary servitude. There's work now to get that phrase out of that amendment. Because that means technically, I can have you work in the lumbering industry. This fellow over here needs help in a coal mine. Watch that. The 14th Amendment is the Citizenship Amendment. And that, it does two things. It's a Citizenship Amendment, and it also punishes. It's passed in 1868. It also punishes the slave South. Let me read the first part. It is a Citizenship Amendment. All persons, born or naturalized, that's a problem. Born, you know, if you're born here, you become a citizen. That's been a problem lately, hasn't it? Uh, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are, are, are citizens of the United States of, and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Abridge the privileges or immunities. They did not find to find privileges or immunities. That's still up in the air, isn't it? What are the privileges and immunities of citizenship? Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. What is due process? That phrase was first introduced in the Fifth Amendment. What is due process? Nor to, nor to deny any person within his jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. This is the 14th Amendment is the most litigated amendment in the country. It, it goes it go back to that over and over and over again. What are the privileges and immunities of citizenship? They didn't know. They didn't define it. It's defined every day, isn't it? Within his jurisdiction, the equal protection of the laws. What is the equal protection of the laws? It varies from case to case, doesn't it? It varies from state to state. Now, this whole, not getting into this, this whole Roe v. Wade thing, you know, is, is going to be part of this eventually. <coughs> you know, the equal protection of the laws. 1868, Massachusetts ratified the 13th Amendment, it was the eighth state, to ratify the 13th Amendment, and I believe Massachusetts was the eighth state to ratify the 14th Amendment. Now, the next amendment, the, these are the Civil War amendments. The Amendment 15 is the, do I have the right number here? Yeah, Amendment 15 is the right to vote. Now, if you look carefully, and this is your homework tonight, and I'll be calling you. Leave me your phone number, I'm talking to you. All right, leave me your phone number. I'll be calling you. That in that 14th Amendment, I'll be calling you, all right? In that 14th Amendment, there is certain specific language applied to the Confederate states. For example, that they cannot pay their debt because that implies that what you did was legal. Debts to your citizens for war bonds. Pay, to repay loans given to you by France or England. To repay your soldiers. That implies what you did was legal. So you cannot repay your debts to your citizens, to the states that loaned you money, or to foreign countries that loaned you money. That implies what you did was legal, that you were a legal government nestled inside the United States of America. Read that amendment tonight. That's your homework. And the 15th Amendment, the right to vote to all citizens. And Republicans believe that Black America would vote Republican, 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 because Lincoln was the emancipator. And for years afterwards, the black vote, when they could vote, you know, if you, if you weren't run out of town by the Klan or other white supremacist agencies, um, organizations, th that the right to vote would go Republican, 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 because of Lincoln.
Now that all changed, didn't it? Now it's Democrat, 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 and that's Wilson, more importantly, Franklin Roosevelt. Read these three amendments. They are the Civil War Amendments. Emancipation is now an amendment that you're now a citizen and you have the right to vote and cannot be run off from the polls by the Klan. Now that is still being talked about today, is it? You know, Lyndon Johnson, the Second Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Second Reconstruction. And Lyndon Johnson would today be among the top 10 presidents, you know, if well, he got this passed, not this, but, you know, those other bills, if it had not been for the Vietnam War. And you know that. Lyndon Johnson's reputation was soured by the Vietnam War. You know that. Some of you in front of me may have fought in Vietnam or have been maybe drafted but never sent. I was going to be a helicopter pilot. How about that? You want to be a, helico be a helicopter pilot with me? <laughs> and I'm in the helicopter? <laughs> Hello down there. But the whole thing ended before I got into training to be a helicopter pilot. I've enjoyed that. Do you know what the test was? I knew what the final exam was. You got the instructor there. And he pulls the plug. The helicopter spins into a default. Can you get it out of a default, out of a skid landing, before it crashes? <laughs> your life, my life, is in your hands. I didn't want to have to do that, to go through that. Can you imagine? All of a sudden, bang, the whole thing begins to drop, and they drop like, gosh, they drop like a, uh, like a stone, don't they? So those are, that's your homework assignment, 13, 14, and 15. Now there's a piece of this that I think I want to get back to, and maybe some will ask a question that will throw a switch in my head. Questions, observations? What did Andrew Johnson really think of slavery? Who? <laughs> um, Andrew Johnson? Yeah. He thought it was evil. He freed his slaves. He thought it was evil, and uh, it was not going to be part of, good question, thank you, that it was not going to be part of any restoration. All right? Restoration without slavery. And you know that when the, in the aftermath of the Hayes, that's what I forgot, in the aftermath of the Hayes-Tilden election, in which Tilden, who won the electoral vote, he won the electoral vote, but he gave it up. He's a Democrat. He gave it up to put the Republican Hayes in the White House. And the deal was that I will give up my victory. He's a Democrat from Illinois. I will give up my victory if you promise me this, that you will withdraw all northern troops from the Confederate States. And when that happened, that's when the killing and the lynching and the burning took place. more so than it had been. Read up just on the 1876 election. Tilden won it, and the Hayes people came to him. Will you give it to us? He won it by one vote. No, Tilden needed one vote. Hayes needed one vote. Will you give up your electoral victory to us and promise that, the Hayes people, and promise that, that you will withdraw all northern troops? And he does. And that's when the lynching and the burning all came into, all, all started. The, read the auto, autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, or read or, or watch the film, Miss Jane Pittman. It's there. You know, I mean, it developed slowly, but it's there. That's not part of your homework, but that's an extra credit assignment. <laughs> and if you give me a blue book, I'll read it and I'll grade it. 